وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمًا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, Before I start I just want to thank Mona Huzaif and the team at Siblings of Ilm for, for giving me the opportunity actually to come and be part of the good work that they're doing Alhamdulillah uh, Just flicking through the YouTube channel there are a lot of a lot of beneficial videos out there. Um, and they, they're also touching on uh, sciences which, which aren't so commonly addressed and which aren't commonly taught. And it's not easy to have access to certain topics. Um, so even for example, I had a session on poetic meters, it's something that I've always wanted to study myself and look into myself but never had the opportunity to. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless uh, the team at Siblings of Ilm for making knowledge so easily accessible to the ummah and bringing different, uh, different types and different segments of the religion of Islam to the forefront. And I'd like to thank everybody else for joining the session. Uh, inshallah, this session will cover the key principles in relation to the fiqh of fasting. So just trying to make sure that our month of Ramadan and our fasting in the month of Ramadan is done in a manner which as best as we can, we can get it to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. Now, of course, we can never get, we can, nothing can be perfect. And at the end of the day, we all make mistakes and we make errors. But inshallah, inshallah, if we have the right bits of information and we have some awareness and understanding in relation to the fiqh of fasting, then we can try our best to try and get to whatever we can and as, to make our fasting as best as we can and avoiding any of those uh, simple mistakes or errors by which a person may either invalidate their fast or may render their fast makru and disliked. So it's, a, it's an act of worship and we want to do this in the best possible manner that we can, inshallah ta'ala. If anyone has any questions as we go along, so the, the way I've, I've uh, designed this, uh, this presentation, very similar to the fiqh of zakat, um, in that the key principles will be discussed uh, the tools will be presented as to how to work out whether something invalidates the fast or not, and whether something requires a penalty to follow or not. And then I will leave it to the, the, the attendees and the viewers to, to look at the cases that I present and try and work out from there what will actually break a fast and what will not break a fast. So the idea is to take away the, the key concepts, the important bits of information, the tools, the usul, the principles, the framework, and then be able to utilize that framework to try and judge basic scenarios as to whether it will be something which invalidates the fast or not. At the same time, bear in mind that there will be certain cases um, or circumstances which individuals may have which might not be, you know, it might, you may not be able to discuss it in a, a presentation like this. It might require more detailed discussion. Um, so we will always guide you on to, to ulama, to scholars, uh, seek consultation from scholars and also from uh, medical professionals as well uh, to be able to uh, make the right judgment and the right decision. The scenarios that can come about are, you know, limitless. There are so many different scenarios that can come about. We won't be able to address all of them, but inshallah, if we have the framework in place, then inshallah, we should be able to deal with most or a, a good, a, a large uh, chunk of them, inshallah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون When we fast, there has to be a purpose and there has to be an objective to our fast. And yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed certain rules and principles that we need to follow. So we need to avoid eating, we need to avoid drinking, we need to avoid intimacy during the month of Ramadan. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to achieve something. There needs to be an end goal to it. It can't just be purposeless. It can't just have no objective. It can't just be a, a, a mere ritual act and that's it. So in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly explains the purpose and the objective of fasting. At the end, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ That all you who believe fasting has been made obligatory on you just as it was made obligatory on those before you so that you may attain taqwa so that you may attain piety, so that you may fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
so that you may be able to control yourself and exercise self-restraint so that you may be able to stay away from things which are harmful, things that which are detrimental to a person's faith and detrimental to a person's iman. Now, that is the end goal, that is objective. And the way we're going to get there is by siyam, by fasting. So the process is the fast and the objective is to attain taqwa. Now we can measure ourselves and we can see that last Ramadan or the Ramadan before, the Ramadan before, did our fasting actually, you know, make us a better Muslim? Did it make, it a, make us a better slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Did we increase our relationship and closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or was it just something we did for a few days or a few weeks and then we went back to our normal routine afterwards? There needs to be a, a significant change between who we were before Ramadan started and who we are after the month of Ramadan comes to an end. So the 30 days or 29 days of Ramadan is the training, it's the preparation. It's like if a person has to sit an exam, just before the exam, the one or two days or one or two weeks before is when they're going to really work hard, they're going to get all the information that they've been going over, they're going to practice as much as they can. And then eventually on the day of the exam, that's when they're going to write the paper and they'll be judged as to whether they pass or not. Now, when it comes to the month of Ramadan, the month of Ramadan is not the end goal. The month of Ramadan is our training period. It's our phase of training. This is when we, we reshape ourselves. This is when we work on who we are. And the test and the exam comes from the day of Eid onwards. That have we managed to change ourselves? Have we managed to bring ourselves so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that now the month of Ramadan has been taken away, we can actually worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be closer to him than we were before Ramadan had started. But that's the kind of measure that we want to have in place, that the month of Ramadan needs to have an impact. It needs to change us. It needs to bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, how is it going to do that? How is just staying away from eating and drinking and intimacy during a certain amount of time going to uh, save a person and going to protect a person um, you know, and make a person better? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us through this exercise of staying away from eating and drinking, how to control our inner self, how to control our desires, how to control our nafs. Now, inside us, we have this nafs that kind of pulls us in all sorts of directions. If it's not being tamed, if it's not being controlled, it'll pull us into doing things that we shouldn't be doing. It'll be pulling us towards the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and taking us away from what we should be doing. Now, when there is an inclination or a desire to do something wrong a person has two options option number one is they just go ahead with what they're being told to do and they go and commit the crime that they shouldn't have been that they shouldn't be committing and what happens when they commit that and they feed the soul they feed the nafs what has happened now is the nafs actually becomes stronger so when it provides a temptation for the second time it becomes a lot more difficult to overcome the nafs and the more you agree with it, the more you follow it, the more you support it, the more it grows and the stronger it gets and the more power it has over us. On the other hand, when a person has a temptation to do something wrong, if at that point they take the other option and the other route, and they say, no, I'm not going to do that because that's not something that I should be doing. At that point, what happens, even though it's very difficult to do, if they are able to do that, then what happens is the nafs actually becomes weaker. And the inclination to sin and the desire and urge to do something wrong actually becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. And the more you deny it, the more you repel it, the weaker it becomes. And eventually, the person themselves have has control over what they want to do, whether they want to do right, whether they want to do wrong. And the influences of the nafs is a lot more weak and it's under control. Now, if you look at the kind of things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to stay away from, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse hasn't told, uh, in fasting, hasn't told us to just stay away from sin. The, the, the primary aspect of fasting is not, don't do ghibah, don't do zina, don't steal, don't lie, don't slander. No. The primary focus in fasting is stay away from eating, drinking, and your sexual desire. Now, these three things are generally permitted. It's permissible for a person to eat. It's permissible for a person to drink. If I want to go to the kitchen right now and take some water, I can drink that and there's no harm in that. I won't be sinful for it. 
Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us in the month of Ramadan to be able to control ourselves in those things which are permissible for us. If we can manage to control ourselves in that which is lawful, and even though it's permissible for me to, in the middle of the day when it's really hot, just drink a glass of water to cool myself down, but just because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told me not to, even though it's generally permissible for me, I'm still going to abstain. Why? Just because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've over, I, uh, I, I, I overcame my desire and I took control and I took charge and I followed the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when we do that with those things which are permissible and lawful for us, and we're able to exercise that much self-control and self-restraint, then inshallah, inshallah, that should then by default and even more so give us the, the strength to be able to overcome those things which are impermissible for us in the first place. So we're starting at a very basic level where we're training ourselves in the permissible so that automatically the impermissible becomes something that's just far-fetched. It's not something that we're even going to think of doing. It's not even something that we're going to contemplate anymore. So that is the training that is happening in the month of Ramadan. Think about something as blessed as the water of Zamzam on a hot day and you just want to drink it. Then you can't because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said no. In the long days of fasting, alhamdulillah, the, the days have got a lot shorter than it was a couple of years ago in this country. But even then, it's, it's still difficult to maintain those levels of fast at times. But you told yourself that from your normal routine of eating and drinking and having lunch and dinner and brunch and breakfast and all sorts, just because of one thing, only one thing, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's order, and that's it. Now, there are so many orders and commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which many we follow, and sometimes, unfortunately, we, we fail or we're not able to do, uh, and we, we make mistakes, we make errors. So this month of Ramadan is training us. This, it's a training period of give priority what Allah subhanahu wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to us as opposed to what our desires are saying to us. So that will then make us closer and more conscious of the kind of things that we're doing in our day-to-day -day routine. Eventually this month of Ramadan will be like the fuel stop where you fill yourself with petrol and fuel so that you can go on the journey for the next 11 months topped up with spirituality, with closeness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and eventually that will give you enough momentum and give you enough push till the next Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala. Now, in relation to the virtues of fasting, because it's very close to the month of Ramadan and with the build-up to Ramadan, there are numerous videos and lectures and Juma uh, talks and all sorts on, on the virtues of Ramadan. So I've covered a few basic principles. We won't go into this too much detail. Uh, we'll focus more on the, the fiqh of fasting. But just as a mode of encouragement and through seeking blessings from the, 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 the speech of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we'll go through a few narrations of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So firstly, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said he will fast in Ramadan with firm belief and with hope of gaining reward. His previous sins will be forgiven. Now everybody wants to go and meet Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala with a clean slate. We don't want to go on Yomul Qiyamah with any debt anything outstanding, anything that's unpaid, whether it's salat, whether it's fasting, whether it's zakat, whether it's sins we've committed. We want to go in a state where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be pleased with uh, us in that state. So the month of Ramadan is an opportunity for us to just watch away and cleanse ourselves of any errors and mistakes that may have been made beforehand. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa also said that in paradise there is a gate which is called Rayyan, through which only the people who fast would enter the day of resurrection. No one else would enter along with him. So a specific entrance, a specific, you know, when, when someone special comes, you have a, a way of bringing them in. There's a special entrance, there's a special ceremony, there's a special way that you receive that person. So a fasting person holds so much value in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the view of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that there's a special gate just for people that would fast and nobody else is allowed to enter through that gate. And it will be announced that where are the people who fast that they should be admitted into it. And when the last of them would enter, it would be closed and no one would enter it. So only specifically for the fasting people, a very specific reward only for them. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, every deed of the son of Adam brings 10 rewards. And it can be increased up to 700. That is the mercy of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. Not like us, that we take one for one. You give me one thing, I'll give you one thing back. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala sees that you do good and he just multiplies and multiplies and multiplies. However, when it comes to fasting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, except for fasting, fast is for me and I will give the reward for it. 
there's no, it can't be counted, it can't be measured. There's no way of quantifying the reward for fasting. It's just down to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his mercy. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he leaves his desire, food and drink for my sake. Fasting is a shield and there are two pleasures for a fasting person. One at the time of breaking his fast, whether that's at iftar, at the end of the day or at the end of Ramadan on Yom al -Eid. And the other is when he will meet his Lord. So we want to be some people who, who will have that pleasure of seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it being a pleasurable moment. Not one where we're, where, where we're drowning in fear because of the wrong that we have committed. So fasting is a way of making your, our, bringing ourselves into that group of people who will be pleased to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be pleased to meet them. And the smell of a fasting person is better in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the smell of musk. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also said whoever does not fast one day in Ramadan without any concession, allowing, uh, without, uh, without having a concession allowing that or illness, fasting for a lifetime will not make up for that. So the, the place and the period of Ramadan is so important and has so much value and virtue that if you were to miss one of those fasts in the month of Ramadan, even if you were to try and continue fasting for the rest of your life, you will never be able to make up for that one fast which was missed out because of the value and the virtue that fa that fast had in the month of Ramadan. And that's why we should make our, you know, we should try our best to make sure that we don't have any fasts that are broken, we don't have any fasts that are missed out um, without any sort of excuse. Now we will discuss what is a valid excuse and what is not a valid excuse as we go through the slides, inshallah. Now, in terms of the definition of fasting and what fasting means, so from a linguistic or literal meaning, it just means to abstain and to refrain or to stay away from something. But when it comes to a shari definition of what does fasting actually mean in, in the religion of Islam, it means to refrain from eating, drinking, and intimacy, sexual intercourse between dawn and sunset with the intention of fasting. And we'll go through each of these components one by one and open them, inshallah. But the general idea is there are three things that we're taking into consideration. One is eating, one is drinking, and the third is our sexual desire. The time frame in which we need to be careful is between dawn, fajr, and sunset, maghrib. That is the time that we need to avoid these things. And we have to have the intention of keeping a fast and uh, being in the state of fasting. Now, before we go into the, the, the key rules, there are a few different types of fasts that a person might keep. And it's important to understand this because this plays an, in, uh, a role, especially when it comes to making an intention and what type of intention and when the intention needs to be made. So you have number one, you have the compulsory fast, so the third fast of Ramadan, of course. Then you also have compulsory fast such as vows. So if a person made a vow that, Ya Allah, if I, um, if I have passed my GCSEs and I get such a result, then I will fast for 10 days. And that becomes a vow. And if you receive the results that you made the vow for, then you will have to, it's compulsory to fulfill the vows, to fulfill the vow and complete those fasts. Then you have the sunnah and preferred fast. So these are fasts which either the Prophet ﷺ kept or indicated to there being some sort of virtue in. So for example, fasting on a Monday and a Thursday, fasting in the middle days, the ayyam al the 13, 14, and 15 of the month, uh, fasting on the 9th and 10th of Muharram, Arafah, and the sixth fast of Shawwal, and so on. So these are not compulsory, but they're sunnah or preferred mustahab fast. Then you have unlawful fast. So it's prohibited for a Muslim to fast on five days in the year, two days of Eid, Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr, and three days following Eid al-Adha. So that's five days in total, Eid al-Fitr at the end of Ramadan, and then during Hajj, at the time of Hajj, the 10th of Dhul Hijjah, so you have Eid al-Adha, and then the 11th, 12th, and 13th of that month as well. So those five days is prohibited and impermissible, and a person will be sinful for fasting on these days. Now, who is fasting compulsory on? It is compulsory upon a Muslim, of course, uh, someone who is mature, so someone who is balir, and whether that is through age, whether that is through signs of maturity, um, for a boy that may be for a wet dream, for a girl that may be for having a, a menstruation period and so on. And a person who is able to fast and doesn't have a valid exemption to fasting. So there are certain people who have an exception. They don't have to fast, they are exempt and we'll have a look at them as well. But these are the key uh, conditions and criteria for a person 
who has to fast and upon whom fasting is compulsory. They are Muslim, they are mature and they're able to fast. Fasting is not compulsory on the following people. Now, these individuals, some have a choice whether they want to fast or not, and some are just not able to fast. They're not allowed to fast. So the first person is a sick person, a person who is ill. Now, illness is a very broad term. Marad, sickness is a very broad and generic term. And there are millions of different states that a person can find themselves in. Now, when we talk about a sickness here, which exempts a person from fasting, we're not just talking about you know, a, a bit of pain in the body or a slight headache or migraine. Um, you know, um, generally when we fast, especially in the first few days, because of the change in our diet, we have some impact on our body. We have headaches, we, 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 feel, we don't feel as good as we would normally feel. You'll generally start to feel a bit weaker as well because you're not eating for a prolonged amount of time, more so in the first week than the subsequent weeks. So we're not talking about that. We're talking about an actual sickness and illness where fasting would either be detrimental to that person. You know, it could it, it could be fatal, it could be lethal, it could actually result in them passing away. That then of course that person is exempt from fasting. In fact, if fasting would actually result in a person passing away, they would actually be sinful if they fasted because you have to take care of yourself and that person is exempt. Or if a person is extremely ill to the point that the day-to-day -day routine, the day-to-day -day chores that they would go about and do, they can't do that if they were to fast. Or they've got to a point where they're, you know, they're, they're stuck in bed, they're not able to move, they, they're finding it extremely difficult to continue with the fast, their health is deteriorating, or they already have their illness, and their illness is being uh, worsened as a result of their fast. Or they're going through a period of recovery, and their recovery would be delayed by them fasting. Now, we'll have a look towards the end about more details in relation to this, and we'll bring about certain cases and scenarios, inshallah. And if anyone has any questions, we can address those questions there as well, inshallah. But sickness and illness, generally, we're talking about a person who would be extremely dangerous or harmful to their health if they were to fast. Uh, there are certain options, you know, there are certain solutions. Um, one is trying to manage, especially if you have medication. So if you're able to manage your medication that you can take it before Fajr and after Maghrib and that will be okay for you, then of course, ideally do that and keep the fast. If you get to a point where you feel that you can't fast and the, in, the, the best thing is to try and manage it. So if you're able to adjust your routine to be able to allow you to fast and that is the first option. That is the first option that you're going to explore. Can I adjust my routine? Can I adjust my work pattern? Can I adjust my shift and so on? To be, and just take it easy, take some time off in Ramadan to be able to fast. Uh, otherwise, what a person can do is if, for example, they can't fast um, consecutively, they may want to fast for a couple of days and then one day use that as an opportunity to re-energize themselves uh, for the following days. As opposed to that would be a better option than just not fasting continuously. If a person is able to do like an on-off kind of phase um of course this would need to be consulted the exact details that would need to be consulted with a medical professional as well as a scholar see these are the two individuals that would always need to be consulted medical professionals and scholars to be able to try and manage uh, sickness and illness and medication during the month of ramadan but generally if a person is sick to that degree where they can't fast and they don't have to fast they are exempt from fasting and after recovery they will then perform uh, make up for those fasts at a later date the second is a traveler. Now, some, there are a bit of, there's a bit of misconception regarding who is considered a shari'i traveler and who is actually exempt from fasting. Now, the key principle to remember when it comes to tra traveler in Musafir is traveling does not permit you to break your fast. Rather, it permits you to not keep the fast in the first place. A very important principle to bear in mind. And the point of consideration is dawn the beginning time of Fajr. So if, for example, a person is deemed a traveler, a musafir, meaning they're going to travel in total a distance of 48 miles or more, and they have already left the local town, because when you leave the local area, that's the point at which you are now considered a traveler, a musafir. So you now, the, the, the rulings of a traveler will now apply. So for example, you now pray two instead of four for dhahr, right? You're now a traveler, so you're going to do a fasr. So if you are deemed a traveler at the time of dawn, 
then you are allowed to not keep that fast. You are now permitted to not keep that fast. And you can go on your journey, you can travel, and then after Ramadan, you can make up for however many fasts you miss while you're traveling. If, however, you are resident whilst, even you were resident at the time of dawn, at the beginning of Fajr time, you were resident, even though you're going to travel later on in the day. In that case, you will still have to keep the fast. So, for example, if a person's flight is at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, they're going to leave their house around 9 o'clock, right? So at 9 o'clock, they're still in their house. They're still living in their local area. They're still living in their town or their city. They're considered a muqim, a resident, right? At the time of Fajr dawn, they were a resident. Even though later in the day, they're going to be a traveler. So that person must keep the fast because they were not considered a traveler at the time of dawn, so they must keep the fast. Of course, if a person didn't want to keep the fast, the way around this would be to make sure that you are a traveler before the time of dawn, whether that means leaving your city or going to somewhere else before the time of dawn, then you won't be, you will be exempt from fasting. If, however, such a person was to break their fast, they will only have to make up for one fast. They will not make kafara in this case, because at the end of the day, they were still a traveler, so they will only have to make up a qada, a one, one make up. They won't have to pay the penalty and kafara. So that's the, that's the principle regarding a Shari traveler. So just remember that you need to be a Shari traveler, not just I'm traveling within my town and consider myself a traveler. No, someone that's traveling 48 miles or more, they've already left their hometown before dawn and they're considered a Musafir, whereby the rules of a traveler are applying to them, meaning they're reading, for example, two rakats. Then they can, they are absolved, they don't have to fast. If they wanted to fast, they can fast. If they feel that they are able to fast, then they, they, they can fast and they should fast. If they're going to be a burden to other people by fasting, you know, you're traveling in a group and you feel that if I fast, I'm going to become so, so weak um, that everybody else is just going to have to take care of me and do half of my work for me. And of course, it's best not to fast. But this is provided that you were already a traveler at the time of dawn. So for the sick person and the, uh, the traveler, there's an option as to whether they want to fast or not. Uh, number three is a menstruating woman. Now, I heard that the uh, siblings of William had a separate course specifically for the fiqh of fasting related to uh, um, issues pertaining to women. But we will mention some key principles. We won't go into too much detail. Uh, a menstruating woman cannot fast, or even if the person is going through nifas, or natal bleeding, you cannot fast during that time. Uh, even if you wanted to fast, you cannot fast. Um, and also, if uh, uh, a woman was to become pure during the day, even if it's before midday, they will not be allowed to fast. Rather, the entire day must be made up again after Ramadan. The next category is a woman who is pregnant or breastfeeding, and they feel that, or they don't just have this feeling, they, they're quite confident and they have a certain level of confidence that if they were to uh, keep a fast, then they will be harmful for either themselves or it will be harmful for the child. Then they are also permitted to not fast. So they have a rukhsa whether they want to fast or not. They consult, take mashwara and guidance from scholars and again from the medical professionals, uh, speak to the GP and so on and find out what is possible, what is not possible. Is it possible to, uh, you know, just work on a particular diet to assist? or is it better to not fast and so on. So then you have to take that into consideration and make a decision. But a pregnant woman and a breastfeeding woman also has a dispensation not to fast if there is fear on their own health or fear to the child's health. Okay, in all of these cases, if the person was not to fast, then they will have to make up the fast after Ramadan as soon as possible. So a person has been traveling in the month of Ramadan, they missed 15 fasts, for example. Then when they get home, the day of Eid, they can't fast. But the days after, now they should make up for those fasts as quickly as possible. If they were to pass away before, if, if a person was to pass away before, they had the opportunity to fast, meaning you know, they passed away within five days. Now, they'll be accountable for five days, so they should have fasted for at least five days. But the rest, because they didn't have the time to make it up, they will be absolved of that anyway. So generally, when a person has missed any fast, then especially if you're able to, then you should try and make up for the fast as quickly as possible so that the duty and responsibility is lifted up off your shoulder. Uh, one thing to bear in mind regarding, especially we can mention that here, uh, they, do not have to, uh, they do not have to be made up before carrying out optional fasts. 
So technically, if a person after Ramadan wanted to carry out the six fasts of Shawwal first, and then they wanted to carry out their Qadha fast, that would be valid. You don't, there doesn't, it's, it's not necessary for there to be an order. You don't have to do the Qadha and make up first before optional fast. You can do optional fast first, though, of course, you want to get that responsibility off your shoulder as quickly as possible. Now, a sick person who becomes better at a later point in their life, they will fast, they will make up for those fasts. Some people, they can't fast in Ramadan because the days are longer and their, their health situation is such that they need to take medication at certain times so they can't fast. So the first option is, can they fast in winter? Because the days are much shorter. So between, for example, um, 6, 7 o'clock in the morning till around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, so the fast is a lot shorter. So if a person can make up for a fast during the winter, then they should fast. Then they will have to make up those fasts in winter and make up for the fast once they're better, once the traveler has come back home and so on, once the menstruating, menstruation has come to an end. Um, if a person is terminally ill and they know that they won't be able to fast, they just cannot keep a fast regardless, whether it's summer, whether it's winter, whether you give them a few months to recover, whether you give them five months to recover, they're terminally ill, they have an illness which is ongoing, it's not going to come to an end, and that illness prohibits them and prevents them from fasting at all, then for such a person, if they are not able to fast at any other time, then they will give a fidya in place for each fast. Now, a fidya is basically the amount you pay for sadqatul fitr for each fast, so for one sadqatul fitr per fast. Now, this can, once Ramadan has started, it can be paid. So if a person knows that they can't fast at all and they, they fall within this category of people that can't fast at all, regardless of summer or winter, and then they will pay a fidya. So as soon as Ramadan starts, they can actually pay the fidya for all of those days of Ramadan, even if the fast has not been, the day for that fasting has not happened yet. You can give fidya in advance as long as that Ramadan has started. Now the circuital fitter amount, I haven't actually put the details in here because there are different opinions in terms of calculation um, and measurement and weight. Uh, I would generally advise that your local imam or your the local masjid, they usually print or have the details that sometimes do a calculation and will give you an amount for circuital fitter and how much it is worth. Uh, generally, we're looking at 1.632 kgs of wheat or 3.2 kg of barley, dates, or raisins. So that's the kind of, or the equivalent in cash value. So that's what happens if you're going to be paying a fizzy. Okay, let me pause here. If there's any questions that anyone has at this point, based on what's covered so far, then feel free to just tag them into the chat. So we're gonna discuss many other things going forward, but just in terms of what has been covered so far, if anyone has any questions, then feel free to type them into the chat and I will take them, inshallah. Okay, this question is still being typed. Just regard the fasting. If you have a fard fast, you can do the optional ones first. So, of course, in the month of Ramadan, you have to keep the Ramadan fast. After that, uh, okay, back again. Yeah, you can do optional fast first. So you can keep, for example, the six fasts of Shawwal first, and then you can start making your Qadha if you want to. It's fine as well. There is a difference of opinion as to whether you can combine between the six fasts of Shawwal and your Qadha. The reason why is because the virtue of the six fasts of Shawwal is in addition to the fast of Ramadan, right? So you're keeping the 29 or 30 days of Ramadan plus six of Shawwal, and that gives you the reward of fasting for the entire year. So some scholars have said that the fast of Shawwal should not be combined with a Qadha fast. However, if you did do that, your Qadha fast will be fulfilled. Uh, your vow, yeah, so if you don't get the results that you wish for, does the vow fast it depends on the vow. So your vow is, if, uh, if this and this happens, then I will fast. So if that happens, then you have to fast. Otherwise, you don't have to fast. Of course, if you want to fast, or give some sadaqah and you know to show that you're content with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree, then that is also fine. Uh, yes, Ramadan must start before paying the fidya. Otherwise, um, the Ramadan, otherwise the, the fidya is not, is not bound yet. The month of Ramadan has to have started.
Okay, so there are some questions coming in regarding breaking the fast and so on. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss that, inshallah, coming up. But generally, um, smells and scents will not break the fast. When and how would you class a boy for fasting? So a boy, when they become mature, so that is, for example, generally when uh, they have their first uh, wet dream and they show signs of puberty in that sense, then they will be will now be compulsory for them to to start fasting from that point on. If they haven't and they've reached the age of uh, 18 years, uh, uh, 15, sorry, 15, not 18, 15, uh, then they will have to start fasting from that time. Now become compulsory. They are now technically considered mature. Fast can be made up in winter, as in you have to have a, had a valid reason not to have fasted in Ramadan. If you had a valid reason not to fast in Ramadan, then you will make up a qada. Um, you're meant to do them as quickly as possible. So if you did think that you're going to delay them for winter, then that is a risk because you, know, you never know whether you're going to pass away before that or not, and you've had the opportunity to fast, so you should have fasted before that. But if a person was to delay it till winter, that's the risk that they've taken. Uh, but the fast, the, the, it will still be made up and it will still be valid. If you have a sickness and illness and you want to fast, you can fast, provided that it's not going to be detrimental to you. Because if it's something that's going to put you in, you know, it could be very extremely risky for your for your health, then you will actually, you may even be sinful for fasting, depending on the kind of impact that it will have on you. No, if a if a lady menstruation finishes during the day and she hasn't eaten, she still cannot fast. Uh, she cannot fast. The entire fast will have to be made up. Regarding the iron deficiency, you would have to consult the you know the doctors first. Get as much information as you can from them. Explain all different scenarios. See if there are any other alternative options. What can they take at suhoor and iftar and so on. Um, to help uh, and then take that to a scholar, the exact specific scenario, uh, and then uh, you'll be able to decide based on that, inshallah. Can the sixth fast of shawal be kept by someone who's missed from a fast? Yep, you can be kept, like I said, the order doesn't have to be kept. Okay, let me just carry on uh, so that we can get through some of the slide, uh, slides and then we will come back to the questions, inshallah. Now let's have a look at intention. Let's have a look at intention when an intention needs to be made. The intention needs to be made each day to differentiate worship from routine. Now I'm going to explain exactly what intention means. Intention is just a feeling in the heart and a knowing and acknowledgement in the heart that you know you're fasting. That is an intention, right? Now remember, by default, every Muslim is going to intend to fast in the month of Ramadan. Okay? You don't need to sit and think that or verbally say anything. You don't even need to just sit and think that. I am actually going to be fasting tomorrow. I am going to be fasting today. And this is my intention for fasting. No. If a person knows that they're going to be fasting, then they already have that intention within their heart that they're fasting. And as a Muslim, by default, you're going to have the intention they're going to be fasting. Unless you have a firm intention not to fast. Somebody saying, I'm not going to fast regardless, right? I'm not fasting in Ramadan, right? So that kind of person is not, they've made an active intention not to fast. Because when you wake up, for example, for Suhoor, Right. Why are you waking up for suhoor? You're waking up for suhoor to fast. Right. So you know that you're keep doing it for a fast. And that is all part of your intention. If you wake up in the morning and you don't have breakfast, you would always have breakfast. Eight o'clock would be without fail. And all of a sudden, this day in the year, you're not having breakfast. You're not having breakfast. Why? Because you're fasting. So all of these are included within fast, intention for fasting. So these, these are all indicators that you are fasting as part of your intention. Now, when does the intention need to be made? It depends on the type of fast. Now, if the fast is one which is already fixed, that tomorrow is a fasting day. For example, the month of Ramadan is, the days are fixed. That, for example, uh, if, if it's Wednesday, I know that tomorrow is going to be a fasting day. I know Friday is going to be a fasting day. I know Saturday is going to be a fasting day. It's already fixed that that day is going to be for Ramadan. Then you, your intention time is actually from sunset the night before up to midday, right? So anytime between sunset and from Maghrib the day before and midday. So if, for example, 
tomorrow is Ramadan, right? Tomorrow, Monday is Ramadan, for example. Then from after Maghrib today, the day before, up to midday tomorrow, at any time, I can make an intention to fast, right? Now, remember, again, by default, a person is going to have an intention to fast anyway, unless there's for some reason, unless they don't fast or they've got an exception to fast, you're generally going to have the intention to fast anyway. But that is the time period at which you're going to make an intention to fast. Now, by midday, we're not referring to Zawal, Zahr beginning time midday. We're not talking about noon, right? We're not talking about the middle between sunrise and sunset. We're looking at the time between Fajr beginning and sunset, right? So just say, for example, uh, six o'clock is when Fajr begins, right? Six o'clock is when Fajr begins. And six in the evening is when sun sets, right? So 12 o'clock in the afternoon, that is your midday. Even though technically the sun isn't at its highest point because the sun rose at 7.30. So midday is actually going to be at some point after 12 o'clock, right? The midday where the sun is at the highest is actually after. Whereas what we're talking about by midday is going to be earlier than that. It's going to be the middle point between the beginning of Fajr time and sunset. So that time is going to be called Dahwatul Kubra. That's the middle point at which you, because half your fast starts at Fajr and it ends at Maghrib. So the, you need to have majority with an intention of fasting. So the majority would be would take place if you made an intention before, the midday, taking midday into consideration from dawn and sunset. So if your fast is one which is already fixed from before, that tomorrow is a fasting day, then you have this scope to fast, uh, to make an intention. Another example is, a person says that if I pass my exam, you make a vow, if I pass my exam, and I am going to fast on the 10th of Shawwal. I'm going to keep a fast on the 10th of Shawwal. Now the 10th of Shawwal is a fasting day. It's fixed. Because of your vow, it has become fixed. So now on the 10th of Shawwal, let's say you didn't realize that you were fasting. You totally forgot. And then during the day, around 9 o'clock in the morning, you haven't eaten anything yet, and you realize, oh, actually today's 10th of Shawwal, I'm going to keep a fast. You can still make an intention to fast because it's not reached midday. It's not the middle between dawn and sunset. It's not reached midday, so you can still make an intention to fast and continue not fasting, provided, of course, you haven't eaten anything. Another set of fasts that come into this are um, um, uh, nafal, optional fast. With optional fast, you can also make an intention up to midday. So, for example, one day you wake up, you haven't eaten anything, you haven't had breakfast, it's around 10 o'clock, and it's not midday just yet, and you think, you know what, I might as well just keep a fast, I've not eaten anything yet. Anyway, there's only six hours left till the fast comes to an end. Uh, so let me just keep fast. You can also do that, and that will also be valid. So if the day is already fixed for fasting from beforehand, or it's an optional nafal fast, whether it's Shawwal, Muharram, Arafah, Monday, Thursday, three days in the middle of the month, whichever optional fast, you can keep an intention up to midday is your point that you can make an intention for. If it's not fixed from beforehand, then you need to make an intention before Fajr. You need to make an intention before Fajr. So for example, if it's a kafara that you're making, if it's a vow that you said you'll fast on any day and it's not fixed from beforehand, or it's a qada of Ramadan. So for example, you missed a fast in Ramadan and you need to make one up. So that's, it doesn't have a fixed day that you're going to fast. So for that fast, you have to make an intention from before dawn. So before Fajr starts, you have to make an intention. Otherwise, it will become a nafal fast and it will not be an intention. It will not be a valid fast for, the, for what you had intended. So generally, especially if it's a Ramadan fast, you don't need to make a specific intention that I'm keeping a Ramadan fast, so on, so on, so on, so on. But you just need to know that you're going to be fasting and that fast will, uh, by default, apply for you. Uh, if a person is traveling, if a person is sick and they have the option, you know, if a person is traveling, they have an option if they want to fast or not, uh, they can make an intention to fast. If they don't want to fast, then they won't make an intention to fast. If they make an intention to do like a Qaba or something, then that will also take place because for them, the door is open. The, 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 it's open, it's not fixed for them. Ramadan isn't fixed for them because they have the option whether they want to fast or not. As for a general person who is at home, they're going to be keeping a fast for Ramadan. So that's the key general principles in relation to making an intention. So when it comes to Ramadan, that's the time period between midday and um, between dawn and um, sunset. Now, suhoor, pre-dawn meal, the Prophet ﷺ said, have suhoor, for verily in suhoor, there is blessing, there is barakah. And not only is the barakah, but it shows a, a level of need to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I'm needy. So right up until the point that I'm not allowed to eat, I'm going to eat and I'm going to 
put something into me because I need to get that energy because I'm in need of your help and your support. And it, it, it takes away that level of arrogance. Like, oh, I don't need to have support. I can stay hungry. There's no, there's no, there's no worry for me. You know, I can take this on. So there's a lot of blessing and barakah and support. The Prophet Allah said, support is a blessed meal. So do not abandon it. Even if you only take a sip of water, really Allah and his angels send blessings upon those who have suhoor. Uh, we want to delay suhoor as close as you can to dawn. Don't delay it so much that you have doubt as to whether it's valid or not. But up close to dawn is fine. If someone fasted without suhoor, it's still valid. The fast is valid. But you would, of course, miss out the reward and blessings of suhoor. Now getting into what breaks the fast and what doesn't break the fast. So there are certain things which break the fast and require you to just make up one fast for the fast that was broken. And there are certain things that if you do that, not only do you have to make up a fast that was broken, but you also have to pay a penalty and you also have to pay a kafara. Okay. So there are two types of actions, but have a look at them. Then there are those actions which don't break your fast. And those actions are of two types. Some are disliked, so you shouldn't be doing them. Though it won't break your fast, but it's disliked. And there are things which are not disliked. Okay. Uh, three things to take into consideration. We're always going to be looking at eating, drinking, and sexual intercourse. Those are the, or intimacy or fulfilling sexual desire. Those are the three things that we're taking into consideration. Now, there are three key principles that I'm going to give. So I'm going to go over the key principles. So take as many notes as you can and just keep up as much as you can. And then I will get, have all the case scenarios and we'll go through them one by one, inshallah ta'ala. So there are three things that need to happen in order for the fast to break. Right? Just for it to break, regardless of whether there's a penalty or not, just for it to break, there's three things that need to happen. Number one, the substance needs to go into the body via a valid entry point. Now, what is a valid entry point? We'll have a look at that in the next slide. Number two, that substance needs to reach the digestive system, the digestive tract, also known as the gastrointestinal tract. Right? If it reaches that and it came in via a valid entry point and it reached that destination, the fast will break. Number three, it is a substance which breaks a person's fast. So for example, if I take in air and I breathe in air, that doesn't really break my fast. It's not a substance that breaks my fast. Even if it went in through a valid entry point and reached a part of the digestive system, it doesn't matter, it's not going to break. So three things we're looking at. It has to enter from a valid entry point, has to reach the digestive tract. And number three has to be a substance which actually invalidates a person's fast. Now, a valid entry point is Something which leads directly to the digestive tract, for example, the mouth, the nose. So if something goes in through the mouth, down the throat, that's going to break the fast. If something goes in through the nose, into the throat, that is going to break the, part, the, the fast. If something is passed in through the backside, through the anus, then that will also lead to the digestive tract. So there are certain medications that people have to take, or you have rectal pessaries or whatever it may be, and they have to insert something, then that because it reaches the digestive tract, that will also break your fast. When it comes to the ear, generally the ear drum doesn't have a route to the digestive tract. So if you put something in your ear, it doesn't break, right? Unless someone has a perforated ear drum, right? Or an ear drum which is ruptured, which most likely isn't going to be the case in normal scenarios. You would know if it would be, right? So if your ear drum is intact and so on, then it won't be a valid point. But if it is ruptured, then that would also be a valid entry point as it goes to the digestive tract and any sort of perforation or puncture into the body even if it's not from the mouth or the nose uh, or, or or the backside and it goes straight into the digestive tract so for somehow you know an incision or is made or an injection or something is made and it goes straight into the digestive tract then that will be a also a valid entry point which will invalidate the fast Invalid entry point is now something which a fast cannot break if a substance enters from one of these areas, right? So for example, the eye. So if you put something into your eye, eye drops, whatever it may be, uh, that will not break your fast. It's an invalid entry point. The male and female external genitalia, the urethra, for example, if something was inserted from the front passage, and that will not break the fast. Uh, if something is inserted in the ear, where the eardrum is not ruptured, then that will not break the fast pores that you have in your body right just you, the dots in your body where sweat comes out of or or moisture just goes, goes into your skin that is not a valid entry point so that will not break your fast so sitting and bathing in water uh even if it cools you down is not going to do, break your fast and any sort of injection or puncture which doesn't go to the digestive system so for example an injection which goes into your 
veins or something which goes into your muscle or your tissue or something like that will not break your fast. That's a very important principle to remember that these types of injections do not break your fast. There's a lot of misconception around injections. They don't break your fast. I've got two diagrams here just to show uh, the ear situation that you've got this uh, membrane here. This is why I was saying that if it was perforated, then that would actually lead down into this tube, which would go to the digestive system, but generally that won't be the case. With the eye, you have this uh, area here, which sometimes when you put things in your eye, you can actually taste something in the back of your throat. That is because there is like a small hole which leads down into the nasal cavity. But like I mentioned, that the eye is not considered a valid entry point. So even if you put something in your eye and you feel it at the back of your throat, it will not render your fast broken. So remember, valid entry points in order for a fast to break. If it's not a valid entry point, the fast will not break. That's the first key principle to bear in mind. This is the digestive tract that I was talking about, that it needs to reach not the mouth, but talking from the throat onwards. So consideration is from the throat right down. So anyway, if, if anything is inserted into any of these parts, right, right to the bottom, then the fast will break. <clears throat> if it doesn't reach here, it just goes into muscle, it goes into tissue, it goes into the veins, it goes somewhere else into the body, then that will not break the fast. So that's two things that we've covered. It has to have a valid entry point and it has to reach the digestive system, right? Number three, the substance has to be something which invalidates the fast. For example, air does not invalidate the fast. You just breathe it in, you just breathe it out. There's no, there's no problem with breathing air in. That's not going to invalidate your fast. Similarly, if you take like an oxygen mask and it's 100% pure oxygen, then that's not going to break your fast either. Something which doesn't have a body. So for example, one is perfume, which I spray, and there's particles that I can actually feel, I can actually taste, I can actually see them in the air. Another thing is I take some oud or some musk or some litter and I just wipe, I, I just put a line on my finger, on my, on my hand, and I can just smell the fragrance. There's no actual body. That is not going to break my fast because there's no body actually entering through a valid entry point into the digestive system. Okay? Um, there are certain things which are very difficult to avoid. So for example, dust, smoke, steam, or you know, you're riding a bike and there's a fly goes into your mouth. But these things, right, dust, flies, smoke, steam, if you're just walking about and you're breathing and it happens to go into you, then your fast will not break. Yeah, even if you know you're fasting and you remember that you're fasting and just through your breathing, this steam came in. For example, um, you're cooking and the steam that's coming out of the pot, you're just breathing normally and it goes into you. Or you're having a shower and it's hot and it's steamy and that goes into you. That's not going to break your fast. Someone's having a barbecue or the, the, the neighbor's garden, they made a little fire and there's smoke and you just breathe that in. It's not going to break your fast, provided, provided that you don't intentionally go and try and inhale it in right so you don't project purposefully inhaling it in. you're not going to the smoke and taking it in for example take some uh, we'll look at cases later on so if you're if you're if you're intentionally inhaling and the steam in or the smoke in or the dust in then that will break your fast but if just habitually incidentally it just happens to go in as you're breathing then that will not break your fast another thing which doesn't break your fast is something which is totally unavoidable for example when you're performing wugu you take water and you rinse your mouth out now, you shouldn't be too excessive when you're fasting. So just try and be a bit cautious. Just rinse your mouth out and then spit it out. Now, what's going to happen is there's two things. Number one, when you put the water in your mouth, you're going to spit that water out. So that's called midge, right? So you can spit the water out. And then you take a bit of your spit and you spit. So then just try and gather what's in your mouth and just spit out as well. So one, take the water out that was already in there. And then number two, just try and gather some, some saliva or whatever and just spit that out. After that, if anything remains in the mouth, that's forgiven because it's unavoidable. There's always going to be some small amount of water which you just cannot remove everything, right? So that's also forgiven. Um, if uh, you started your fast and th there was something stuck in your tooth, right, from beforehand, from Sohor, for example, and the, 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 the amount that I mentioned is a chickpea. So you have chickpeas of different sizes, take a small chickpea size, right? If that small amount is already stuck in your tooth and that was swallowed, that will not break your fast. Yes, if you took a small chickpea and you ate it purposefully, that is going to break your fast. This is talking about something that's already stuck in your mouth and then that happens to be swallowed, that will not break your fast. Because sometimes 
you're eating and there may be something that's stuck between your teeth, uh, there may be a bit of food or there may be a bit of your score if you haven't brushed your teeth or not lost or whatever, still stuck between your teeth. Those small amounts will not break your fast. If it's a large, considerable amount, and small food, right? If it's a large, considerable amount that you swallowed, that will break your fast. Um, there's another thing which the Fokuhar mentioned is uh, so if something uh, becomes so fine, that it's so small, and it becomes, if you grinded it so fine in your mouth that you can't even, it doesn't really go down your throat, it doesn't even feel like it's going down your throat, there's no sensation of it, it's just so small and insignificant, uh, it just probably dissolves in the, in the saliva or the bloodstream or whatever it is, that will also not break your fast. So we've got uh, a valid entry point, it has to enter the digestive tract, and it has to be a substance which breaks your fast, and these exceptions are taken out. Another thing to bear in mind is forgetfulness versus a mistake. If a person forgets that they are fasting, and they eat, or they drink, or they do anything that breaks the fast, the fast will not break. So if I don't remember that I'm fasting, it's the first day of Ramadan, I don't remember that I'm fasting, and I go to the kitchen at lunchtime, I prepare a meal, I sit down, and I eat the entire meal, but I didn't remember that I'm fasting, even though I've eaten the entire meal, I will, my fast will not break because it was done out of forgetfulness, okay? If it was done by mistake, khata, then that will break the fast. For example, I know that I'm fasting and when I'm doing wudu, I can feel accidentally some water went down my throat. I didn't intend for it to go down my throat, but it happened to just make its way and it slipped down my throat. So that would break my fast because that wasn't forgetfulness, that was a mistake. That was an accident. I accidentally swallowed something. One thing is your you know, you're, you're cooking and you just quickly taste something, you forgot and you swallowed it as well. If you didn't remember you were fasting, your fast is not broken. If it was by accident, it slipped down, then that will break your fast. Now, something to remember here that if somebody forgot that they're fasting and you see them and they're eating and they're drinking, should you tell them and remind them or not? So if they are a generally healthy person and they are okay with keeping the fast, then you must remind them. It's necessary. It's actually if you don't remind them that they're fasting. Okay, so if you see someone eating and drinking and they are able to fast, they're generally healthy and stuff, then it's fine. If you see someone really old, right, and the person is extremely weak as it is, and fasting is already difficult for them, then you are there is scope to actually allow them and just you know, you don't need to tell them that you're fasting and they need to stop. Uh, they've forgotten that they're fasting and the fast is not going to break, and you don't need to inform them either. Okay, the next thing to remember is Kathara. Sorry, I'm going through the key principles. And then the cases are going to come. So these three slides are where the cases are going to come, which is where most of the questions will be addressed. So all, everything that I mentioned before is where Qadda will take place. So if we went through a valid entry point into the digestive system and it was a substance which breaks the fast and it was not done out of forgetfulness, the fast will break, a Qadda will have to be made. So you have to make up for one fast, right? Now, when do you have to give a penalty? A penalty is required when the crime is maximized and maximum benefit is gained. So when you get maximum benefit, that's when the penalty is going to come into place. Now, for ex now, a penalty is only required when breaking a fast of Ramadan in the month of Ramadan intentionally without an excuse. So there's a lot to remember that. There's no, you can never have a kafara for breaking an optional fast. You can never have a kafara for breaking a fast which you kept for a vow. There's no kafara for that. Kafara is only for Ramadan fast. And not only the for Ramadan fast, but it's for the fast that is being kept in the month of Ramadan. So this Ramadan that's coming, if you intentionally break a fast in this Ramadan, you have to give a penalty. If, for example, you're making up, you missed some fast this Ramadan and you're doing a makeup for that the following year in, you know, Shawwal or in Muharram, and you intentionally break the Qaba, the makeup fast, there's no kafara there either. There's no penalty there either. It's only for breaking the fast of Ramadan in the month of Ramadan intentionally without any sort of excuse. Now, when, now remember we said that there's different valid entry points, right? A kafara will only take place if you swallowed something. If something went in through your nose or through the back passage or any other way, that is a valid entry point. There will be no kafara. It has to be something which is swallowed. And that thing has to have some sort of nutritional, medicinal benefit, or it provides some sort of enjoyment to you, right? But that is when the, the, the crime is maximized. That's when it's at its peak. If, for example, you eat or you swallow, sleep, for example, you drink water, you eat food, you have a snack, you have some chocolate or something intentionally, and you know you're breaking a fast, then you have to give a penalty because you are intentionally 
going and violating the rules and the sanctity of the month of Ramadan by purpose. If it's something which is not usually eaten or people dislike eating that, then there won't be a kafara, there will only be a qadda. So for example, someone happens to swallow a stone, right? I know it's a bit of a weird example, people don't swallow stones, but if you happen to swallow a small stone by purpose, it's not something you eat, it's not nutritionally beneficial, right? There's no medicine, there's no enjoyment or excitement for, provided by it. So it's not maximized, right? So there is only a qadda and there won't be a kafara. Now, whenever there is any sort of doubt or shubuha or doubt, right, then we drop the kafara. So wherever there's a doubt, we drop the kafara. Kafara is only when you've intentionally, explicitly tried to violate the month of Ramadan. So, for example, if there's a doubt, a person, now this one's a very important case. A person's fast was not broken, but they thought the fast was broken. Right? They thought the fast was broken, but it wasn't broken. For example, if I drink water, I forget that I'm fasting. My fast isn't broken because it was done out of forgetfulness. Now, just say I didn't know that. Now, I drank water, even though my fast wasn't broken, I thought it was broken. Because I thought it was broken, I thought, you know what? Might as well just, you know, go all out and just have a whole meal, right? Now you're intentionally eating a meal, even though your fast wasn't actually broken. Now your fast is breaking when you eat the meal, right? In this case, there will not be a kafara. Okay, there will not be a kafara because a person may have thought, and there is a valid reason that you know there's valid reason to think that intentionally eating, even out of forgetfulness, breaks a person's fast. Right. So the key principle here is if you because this is all based on whether you thought your fast broke or not. If you had a valid reason to think that your fast is broken. You had a valid reason to think that your fast was broken because some other madhab, it breaks in another madhab, or you had some mostly give a fatwa, right? That the fast breaks in that scenario, and you thought that, okay, my fast is broken, whereas according to the Hanafi school, it's not broken. Then you started eating intentionally. You will not have to give a kafara because it was not done intentionally. It was kind of done out of misunderstanding, right? So for example, in the Hanafi school, cupping, Hidama doesn't break your fast. However, there are some ahadith which seem to indicate that cupping breaks your fast, right? If a person had cupping done and then they thought, oh, my fast is broken, and then they ate, they will not have to do kafara because they had a valid reason to think that the fast breaks. Okay, so, so there's a few cases that I've done here. A person intentionally eats after cupping, or you ate out of forgetfulness and then you ate, or you vomited. So there was a case where a person vomited. Now, if you vomit, not intentionally, you just happen to vomit, your fast doesn't break. But some people think that vomiting breaks your fast, right? So if you break, if you feel that, if you thought that your fast broke because you vomited and then you ate, then there is no kafara in that case. Uh, if a person has a wet dream and they feel that their fast is broken and they ate, there's no kafara in that case either. As opposed to something like applying kohar. So you apply surma to your eye and then you think, oh, my fast is broken. So then you eat. There you have to do kafara because there's no valid reason for you to think that kohal or surma will break your fast. Your, your whole understanding is wrong. There's no, there's nothing you could have based that off. So because of that, you will have to give a kafara as well. Penalties are dropped when a mistake is made. So if there's khata or you made a mistake in something, uh, you thought that it was still time for suhoor and you carried on eating, and the mistake is an actual genuine mistake, then there's no kafara there as well. So now these are the key principles. So remember, Valid entry point reaches the digestive tract is something which breaks the fast, right? And if that thing is maximized, whereby you took, swallowed something um, and it had some sort of nutritional medicinal benefit, or you done it out of fun and excitement and enjoyment, then you'll have to also give a kafara. Otherwise, you will not have to give a kafara, it'll just have to be one qada made. Now, let us go through the cases and the scenarios which we have here. So, a person, this is when you can just start using the comment section. So use the chat. So let's start with the first one. A person is riding a bike and a fly enters their mouth and goes down their throat. So is the fast going to break or not? Uh, you can just give a yes or no. The questions that have already been asked, we'll come back to them inshallah. Is the fast going to break in this case or not? So we've got some, uh, no, 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 no. Yes, we said that a fly is, remember it's an exceptional, it's, it's one of those things, dust, fly, smoke, steam, those kind of things. Good. Uh, Zainab is cooking and while she's cooking, uh, steam enters into 
her nose. Is her fast broken? No, no, everyone's saying no. And her son Imran comes, he's really hungry. He likes to, you know, it's smelling really nice. He moves the lid and he inhales the fragrance of the food. Is the fast going to break if Imran was fasting? Some are saying yes, some are saying no. Got a bit of a khilaf here. Uh, write your reasons down as well, please. As to why you think it is or why you think it isn't. So he's just taken the lid off and he's just he's taken in all of that fragrance. Some saying intentionally, some saying no, as it was done accident. It wasn't an accident, it was intentionally. He's inhaling it in. Deliberately smelled it intentionally. Smell doesn't have a body. Okay, so someone's saying smell doesn't have a body. So, which is a good point. If a smell doesn't have a body, then it doesn't break your fast. But what most likely, if something is cooking in a pot, when you leave, remove the lid, what's going to come out? Is it just fragrance? What else is going to come out? Steam. Now, if a person intentionally inhales steam, does the fast break? Somebody intentionally inhales steam intentionally. Yes, right? So there's a difference here. If you're cooking and the steam is, you know, rising and you just happen to breathe it in, that's fine. But if a person is intentionally going over the pot and they're inhaling it, yeah, one is you would have smelt it anyway. One is you just, you know, the smell of the food is in the room, in the kitchen, the steam is in the kitchen, that's fine. But one is actively putting your head over the pot, getting that steam and inhaling that steam in. And that steam is going in and it's going to pass the throat. The throat is part of the digestive tract. So that is going to break the fast. That will break the fast. Of course, if, there were, if it was something cooking where there was absolutely no steam somehow, uh, what can you cook that has no steam? Something that has no steam at all, only fragrance is coming out, right? then that is not going to break your fast. But here we're talking about, you know, steam is actually coming out and you're intentionally taking it out. Okay, uh, applying Vicks or vapor rub around one's nose. Is that going to break the fast? No, because it's a medical reason. Just because something is a medical reason doesn't mean it's not going to break the fast. A medical reason, if it fulfills the condition and criteria that, you know, it goes to the digestive system, it will break the fast. Yes, the medical reason may exempt you from fasting, but just being a medical reason doesn't mean the fast is not broken okay so some are saying only if you put it in water and you steam okay interesting yeah so yeah so it's not going to it's a valid entry point but remember the fix doesn't have a perceptible body that's going to be rising unless you manage to put it in so far in that you can actually feel it kind of melting and going into the nostril and going into the throat that's going to break but if you just generally put it around your nose or on the lips or you, you apply it, you you have it on a tissue and you're just sniffing it right it's not there's no perceptible body that is actually going into you so that won't break your fast just applying vicks around the nose etc won't break the fast yes if you put vicks into boiled water and you're inhaling the steam you're doing steam inhalation therapy or whatever they call it and that will break the fast why because again it's intentionally inhaling steam intentionally inhaling steam into you but that will break your fast. Uh, performing will do some water went down your throat by accident. No, okay, we've done that already. No, are you sure? Performing will do some water went down by accident, not forgetfulness. You knew you were fasting. It slipped down, accident, it will break. It will break, yes, accidents, khata, break. If you forgot you were fasting, you didn't remember that you were fasting at that time and your phone will do and it happens to go down, that won't break. That's funny. That's forgetfulness. Remember, mistake. You didn't intend to swallow it. You're just rinsing your mouth out and suddenly you put a bit too much in and you went to the back of your phone and it uh, slipped in. Right? That will be. Uh, Qada will have to be made. Yes, it will be broken. Okay, you don't understand between forgetfulness and accident. So forgetfulness is when you don't have a recollection that you're fasting. You don't have a recollection that you're fasting, and you even intentionally drink water or accidentally it goes down. It doesn't matter if you don't remember that you're fasting. But if you remember that you're fasting, if you remember that you are fasting, right, you know you're fasting, but something slips down. You don't intentionally put it down, it just slips down. 
That's a khata, that's a mistake, and that will break the fast. But there's two things. If you don't remember your fasting at all, then it doesn't matter if it's a mistake or not a mistake, it's not going to break. Nisyan is so powerful that it doesn't break. Khata will break. Yeah, mistake will break. Uh, let me just go up a bit. There was an interesting point. Vix has no nutritional value and it somehow enters the throat. Because it's, yes, because nutritional value is only to determine whether penalty is required, kafara is required. Um, once it enters the digestive system, Allah will take place. Okay, let me just quickly go through some of these. Yes, what to do if your fast is broken, we'll deal with that in a minute. Okay, so now let me go through some of these quickly because we're running out of time. Um, lighting before and fragrance sticks. So if you light before or a fragrance stick and there happens to be some fragrance in the house and some smoke in the house and you happen to just take in, you're just walking around and breathing and of course like smoke, it doesn't break. But if you went over the before and you intentionally inhaled it in, then that will break your fast. Uh, qada only. Uh, again, remember that you should try and avoid those things which might put your fast at risk. Uh, smelling flowers is not going to break your fast, right? Because there's no perceptible body that is going to go into your nose, right? With the incense stick, if you intentionally take in the smoke and inhale that in, it's going to break your fast. Smoking. If a person smokes a cigarette, they're intentionally taking in uh, smoke. Not only that, but there will be kafara because they're doing it out of pleasure. And excitement and you know it's a, they're doing it out of the to fulfill that urge and craving so because you're doing it to fulfill the urge and craving then smoking will actually be qada and kafara uh, applying oils to the body or surma to the eye uh, will not break the fast that is just going to the pores so again it's not going through a valid entry point into the digestive system so if you look at all of these you can measure them by those three principles cupping again somebody has cupping done there's no substance entering through a uh, entry point into the digestive system, so it won't break the fast. Uh, if you're grinding spices, sometimes if you're grinding chili, you can actually have that taste at the back of your throat. There's nothing that actually went in, it just the strength of it goes into the back of the throat. That won't break your fast. Which method does it break? I'm not sure. I think it's the Shafi, Shafi school. Uh, chewing something. Now, if you're chewing something, if it's something which can dissolve, like, you know, when you have chewing gum, right? It kind of dissolves into the saliva and then it goes into the throat. That will break your fast. If nutritional vaccine, vaccine injection into the body doesn't break your fast unless it's going into the digestive system. If the thing you're chewing doesn't break down, if, something, if it's something you're chewing um, and it stays as a hard substance, you know, you're chewing a pencil or something for whatever reason, it shouldn't be chewing pencils, but if you're chewing a pencil, it's already breaking down and actually going into your stomach. Right, but if it's something which can dissolve and actually particles of it actually go into your throat, then that's going to break your fast. Water entering your ear while you're having a shower, it's not going to break. Regarding blood in the mouth, now this is something important to remember. Uh, regarding blood in the mouth, that if the blood coming from your teeth or your gums is more dominant, and the way to know that is, for example, if you were to sit and you can actually see a redness, then that's an indication that the blood is dominant. So if that was to mix with your saliva and you were to swallow it, then that would break your fast. If it's not so much, it's just a faint color, it's not really red, then that means your saliva is dominant, which means your fast won't break. However, if you can actually taste it at the back of your throat, then that means that's another indicator that, that's, that the blood is dominant. If you can either taste it or with the color, you can tell that it's dominant, that will break your fast, and you'll have to do qada. Otherwise, you won't have to do qada. Enema. So sometimes people have to flush their bowels by inserting something up the back passage and water, they push it through. So that will break the fast because that's a valid entry point going to the digestive system. Can you use mouthwash? Uh, let's go to your, these questions later. Um, if you cleared your throat and as you're clearing your throat, you, know, you just breathe in and some phlegm goes down, that's already in you, so that's not going to break. Tasting food, Provided that you spit it out and you don't swallow it, it's not going to break your fast, but it will be deemed makruh unless you have a reason to. You might have a valid reason to taste the food. For example, you know there's some food for the for a child or something. You need to check how hot it is or whatever it may be. Um, if there's a valid reason, then it will be. If it will not be makruh, provided it doesn't go down, it goes down, and the fast is going to break. If you get mixed up between your sahri and uh, iftar time, 
So you had your iftar a bit too early. It wasn't actually sunset and two minutes earlier you actually started eating. Or you overate into Fajr time, then your fast is going to break. But because it's a genuine mistake, it's going to be a qadha only. Uh, nasal sprays. So if there's actual spray that's going in and it's going to go into you from the nasal cavity, then that's going to break the fast. Also, if you swallow a stone or something, that's not going to break your fast. That is going to break your fast because it's still going through a valid entry point. Some other cases, a person didn't make an intention to fast at all. Now remember, if you did not intend to fast at all in Ramadan, a person has no intention to fast, then there's only qada, there's no kafara, because kafara is only when you've already fasted and you break the fast. If you're fasting and you break the fast intentionally, then there's kafara. Yes, if you didn't fast at all, then you will only have to make a qada, but of course the sin is still just as great, right? Uh, rainwater entered the mouth and was swallowed unintentionally. That will break the fast. Right, so it's only a kafara because it was not done intentionally, but it just happened to go in. Um, the jurists allow when it comes to tears and sweat coming off your body, and it happens to just mix with your saliva. If it's to the point where you can taste a significant amount of saltiness in your mouth, then and and that was swallowed, that will break your fast. Otherwise, it will not break your fast. Uh, a Ramadan qada was broken. Is that going to require kafara or not? A Ramadan Qadha fast was broken. No, because it's not for the Ada, or for the immediate Ramadan. Uh, kissing one spouse will not break the fast. It is makru. It, is, it should be avoided. Unless, of course, saliva is actually swallowed, in which case there will be Qadha and Kafara. Qadha because it's gone down the throat and Kafara because it's done out of enjoyment and excitement. Vomiting. The rule of vomiting is if a person forces themselves to vomit. So many people think that if you vomit a mouthful, your fast breaks. No, that's what we'll do. If you force yourself to vomit a mouthful, then your fast breaks. If you happen to vomit just because you're sick or you're ill and you vomit, even if it's a mouthful, your, your fast is not going to break. So that's an important principle with vomiting. Uh, some people think that being in the state of Janab throughout the day breaks the fast. It doesn't break the fast. Fragrant sprays. Now fragrance, if you spray a fragrance and the body is there, perceptible body, and you actually inhale it in and the particles are going in, your fast is going to break. But if you just sprayed it in the room and you, know, you didn't try and inhale it in and intentionally take it in, then the fast is not going to break. Uh, blood test, backbiting, these things don't break your fast. Uh, though, of course, um, you shouldn't be having a blood test if you feel it's gonna make you really weak and impact your ibadah. Backbiting is still going to impact the spirituality of your fast, so the Technical fast will be valid. Brushing teeth with toothpaste will be makru because you're putting in additional flavor which and scent which shouldn't be um, put into your mouth. Similar just like mouthwash. You can use a miswak, but you shouldn't be bringing in foreign substances like this. If it was to be swallowed, then it will break. If it was to be swallowed, it will break. Uh, blood test will not break wudu. Why? Uh, sorry, it will break wudu. Yes, it will not break the fast. Wet dream doesn't break your fast. Blood test will not break the fast. Being vaccinated will not break the fast. Again, injection into the veins. Okay. Uh, now, when it comes to that, that's all the eating and drinking side, right? Let me just quickly just give an overview of the intimacy side, right? Um, if actual sexual intercourse took place to the point of penetration, regardless of whether ejaculation or not took place, then there will be qadha and kafa. So this is the only case where there's qadha and kafa. There has to be actual penetration, sexual intercourse. Um, to that degree and qadha and kafa. Otherwise, if there was no penetration, but there was physical stimulation followed by ejaculation, then there will be a qadha, not a kafara, there will be a qadha, a fast will have to be made up. Uh, for example, uh, if a person, uh, for example, masturbation will break the fast, it won't be kafara, but it will be a qadha because there was physical stimulation and there was ejaculation, so a fast will have to be made up. If a person has a wet dream, then that doesn't break the fast. Um, that will not impact the fast in any way. A few key principles regarding kafara, and then we'll use the end time to kind of go over any outstanding questions. So if a person has to give kafara, how do they do it? How do they pay the penalty? So number one, the first option is to fast consecutively for 60 days without any sort of break. If you fasted 50 days and the next day you didn't fast, you have to start all 60 again. So penalty is quite severe. You have to fast for 60 days consecutively. There is no valid exception, except for a menstru except for menstruation. 
right? So you fasted, uh, you know, 20 days, uh, and then there was a period 10 days, and then there was fasting again, that's fine, right? For 60 days in that manner. Other than that, that's the only exception which can give you a break. Other than that, you have to fast for 60 days consecutively. Even if Eid came in the between, or Ramadan came in between, uh, you have to you, you have to start your fast again because you can't keep that kafara fast. Only if a person is not able to fast for whatever reason, they can't even fast in the winter months. So two months together, back to back, they can't fast there. They, fasting is not something that they can do at all. Not whether they feel they can't do it, whether Sharia allows them to not fast or not. In that case, then they will feed 60 poor people the amount of Sadqatul Fitr. Right? Have a 60 poor people, you give them Sadqatul Fitr and you feed them all one person for 60 days. Right? If you're going to feed a person meals, then uh, actual food, then you're going to give them uh, two meals a day, lunch and dinner. So if you're going to provide food, then you're going to give lunch and dinner. Otherwise, you're going to give the amount of Sadqatul Fitr times 60. Uh, if a person broke the fast uh, on that day, if a person broke a fast uh, intentionally and they have to do kafara, however, later on in that same day, something happens. Remember, a sister broke her fast intentionally and then during that same day, her menstruation happened to start, right? Or somebody fell extremely ill whereby fasting is not exempt, that penalty will drop, right? Because there is something that dropped because now they didn't really have to fast anyway. Um, if you have multiple kafara, so for example, you broke two fasts in this Ramadan, uh, you broke two fasts in the Ramadan before, you broke a few fasts in the Ramadans before, right? Um, then if those fasts are all within one Ramadan, then you only have to do one kafara. So just say, for example, within the last Ramadan, you broke five fasts, happen to break five fasts. When you do one kafara, all five are done. Right? So all, anything that's done in the past will be covered, right? If it's for multiple Ramadan, so for example, one for the last Ramadan, one from the Ramadan before, one from the Ramadan before, then there are a few different opinions. The third opinion being that, again, one penalty will suffice for all past fasts that were broken. One penalty will suffice. So, for example, you had 10 fasts which you intentionally broke, right? You did one kafara penalty, fast for 60 days consecutively, that will cover all the previous ones. If in the future you break another one, you need to do another kafara. Some, some, um, some scholars say that one penalty is for per Ramadan. Others say you can only combine if you've broken it due to eating and drinking, but not if it's through sexual intercourse. In that case, you have to do a separate one for sexual intercourse for each Ramadan. However, there is an opinion that for one kafara for all previous fa uh, broken fasts will suffice. So that's a few key principles regarding um, kafara. Some dislike and non-dislike acts. So it's dislike to chew something without reason to kiss one's spouse, to gather spit and swallow it by purpose uh, within your mouth. If you took it out and swallowed it again, that would break, right? Delaying suhoor to a point where there's doubt, doing something which you know is going to weaken you, uh, brushing your teeth with toothpaste and stuff is makroo. Things that aren't makroo are miswak, cupping, if it's not going to make you extremely weak. It's finding ways to cool yourself down, have a cold shower or whatever it is, applying quarrel, these things are not, right? Uh, this is a very important slide. It is compulsory. Now, for a person who's not fasting, sometimes it's compulsory to abstain from eating, sometimes it's optional to abstain from eating, right? The first group of people is compulsory for them to abstain from eating and drinking, even if they're not fasting, right? So for example, a person who ate past suhoor time and you accidentally broke your fast, or you broke your fast too early, meaning you opened your fast too early and it wasn't Maghrib time, that doesn't mean you can start eating now. No, it's still compulsory wajib to abstain from eating. Number two, a woman who's menstruating and during the day, her menstruation comes to an end, right? Her menstruation comes to an end during the day, even though she's not going to fast now, even though she's not going to fast, but because her menstruation has come to an end, she now has to compulsory, it's compulsory for her to abstain from eating because now she's technically pure, which means she's like a fasting person. So she has to abstain, compulsory to abstain from eating. If a sick person feels better, if a child becomes mature, if a person becomes Muslim throughout the day, they have to abstain from eating. If a traveler reaches home, because now you're muqim, the traveler reaches home throughout the day, they have to abstain from eating. And in fact, if they reach home before midday, before zawa, before midday, the point between dawn and sunset, if they reach home before midday, 
then what will happen? They have to actually keep the fast now, provided they haven't eaten. But just say you're traveling, you get home around nine o'clock in the morning, you haven't eaten anything yet, you have to keep that fast. If you haven't, if you've already eaten, for example, now you're, you can't keep fast, obviously, but you have to abstain from eating and drinking during this time. Uh, this is, for these people, it's not compulsory to avoid eating, but it's better, it's must have to avoid eating. If a woman is still on her menstruation, or if a person is sick, or if a person is still traveling, then it's preferred for them to avoid eating, especially in front of other people. But in the first scenario, it's necessary, it's compulsory to abstain from eating and drinking. Right, let me just go through one more slide, and then we will go through all the last questions. I'm um, conscious of the fact that time has already passed. Uh, when it comes to medical treatments and medication, always consult a scholar and a medical professional. So uh, you can, for example, fatwacenter.org, you can send questions there for present your scenarios, you can send questions there. There are organizations like al Balagh who have a lot of literature. I'm going to send to Mona Hosefa, inshallah, um, certain documents that are out there, which give a lot of guidance in relation to assessing your medication, what breaks a fast, what doesn't break a fast, and so on. Uh, inshallah, that can maybe be sent out as well. Um, try, uh, so uh, take consultation with a scholar and medical professional to be able to see whether you can fast, whether you can't fast, and whether there's anything that you can do with your medication. Ideally, in, it's better for you to miss a day after every few days than it is to just not fast consecutively. Now, remember, oral medica medication that is swallowed will break the fast. Any tablets or pills that are taken will break the fast. Sublingual, you get sometimes small tablets that are just placed under the tongue, right? Or a spray just under the tongue. If it's something so small and insignificant, and it's such a small amount, that it actually diffuses into the bloodstream. That's the idea of it, right? That's why sublingual is meant to diffuse into the bloodstream. Then that will not break the fast, provided that nothing goes down the throat and you can't feel anything going down the throat. Asthma inhaler will break the fast. The reason why is because when you take the asthma inhaler, you will always feel something at the back of the throat. There's research done to uh, which shows how much of that inhaler actually deposits at the back of the throat and solidifies and then goes down or becomes liquid and then actually goes down into the stomach, right into the digestive system. So because of that, asthma inhaler will break the fast. If you cannot do without an asthma pump every couple of hours, you have to take it, for example. Right? If you can manage, then great. Take it in the morning and evening. If you can't and you have to take it and without taking it, your health is seriously compromised, then you're going to be exempt from fasting. If you can fast in the winter, then fast in the winter days. If you can't fast at all, then you'll have to be giving. It, yeah. Uh, things like concentrated oxygen will not break the fast. Uh, nebulizer breaks the fast. Again, nasal inhaler um, will break the fast. Something through the eye will not break the fast. Same principles that we used before. Something through the ear will not break. Rectal pessaries will break. Internal pessaries will not break because we said the front genitalia does not lead to the digestive system. Uh, anything that's in the veins or the muscles will not break. Okay, so that's just an overview of medicine. Children should be encouraged to fast as much as they are able to, if they can, especially if they are of the age of seven, ten years old. And uh, starting off slowly, maybe if they can keep half a day fast and then building them up slowly, so getting to the habit of it, so that when they become mature, whether that could be 12, 13, then they're going to have to fast. So it's better that they're in a habit of fast. Okay, uh, I know I went through that. Part, last part a bit quickly, but now we can take uh, all of the questions that were missed out, inshallah ta'ala. Um, the key principles have been covered. The key principles have been covered. So uh, any of those questions, um, you know, most of what we discussed will now be based on those principles. But I'm just going to quickly go through what we have here. Um, the vaccine mentioned, it doesn't break the fast, but it's going to go and go into if, as long as it's not going to the digestive system, it's not. VIX has no nutritional value. Does it still break the fast? If it enters, if it enters the throat, then yes, it will break. It doesn't have nutritional value, so it won't result in kafara. Remember, that is for kafara. Putting a perfume on the nose mask. I have no idea about how this is actually working or functioning, right? So again, if the perfume has a perceptible body, which is actually going to go into the nostril and be taken in, then that's going to break. But if it's something where, where like it's a, a liquid which is dripping applied and you can take the fragrance in, then that is not going to break. Eating something out of forgetfulness doesn't break the fast, but eating something accidentally, uh, like a stone of light, does break the fast. So eating something accidentally does break the fast, right? You're intentionally eating accidentally. But the, the fly was an exceptional case because these are things that are 
difficult to avoid. Like if you're riding a bike, it's happened to me. When I'm riding a bike, it's happened that a fly just happens to go into your mouth and throat. So that is to do with there's exceptions to dust, smoke, steam. The rule there is if you intentionally inhale it and then it will break, otherwise it won't break. Um, accident is where it slipped down, right? You, 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 you were rinsing your mouth and what happened to slip down or something. Or you're tasting food and you happen to swallow it by accident, right? That will break your fast. Yes, if you didn't remember you're fasting, then that will not break your fast. So what that means your fast is now broken. But again, that doesn't mean you free for all and you just carry on eating. You need to abstain from eating and drinking still. Vaccines, again, no, no smelling flowers will not break. Um, there's the first one about the fly break the fast or not. I explained that many times. Have nutrition vaccine. Again, it doesn't matter how nutritional the vaccine is. It doesn't go to the digestive system. It's not going to break. Uh, if you take a drip, a glucose drip, even though it gives you energy and stuff, the research of many scholars is because it doesn't fulfill the fact that it goes into the digestive system, it's not going to break the fast. Uh, lip gloss that has flavor to them. Is there actually something going into the throat? If so, then the fast will break. If not, uh, then it's not going to break. If it's really small, insignificant amount that it can't even make its way to the throat, then it's not going to break. Mouthwash or fasting, avoid it. Makro, if it goes down, it will break. Again, all of these things will not be kafara. Kafara is when you intentionally take something like food, drink, nutritional benefit. Um, yeah, so we've covered that. Cover the fly. If you take a nap in the day, like a wet dream, nope. Uh, wet dreams don't break your fast. Yeah, if you, if you became sick during the 60 days, you're going to have to start again. There's no excuse other than menstruation if your period ends before 12 noon you cannot fast at all even if it's and it's not 12 noon remember it's uh, midday between fajr and sunset that's the period that we're looking at if your period ended before that no you cannot fast you have to be in a state that you could fast remember there is, there's a difference between a traveler a traveler has the option to fast right a sick person has an option to fast that's why if they come home before midday or they become better before midday, they have to keep the fast. The menstruation in woman is not allowed to fast at all, right? So even if she became pure, she can't fast because that first part of the day, she wasn't allowed to fast. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't apply there. Okay, uh, let me see if there's anything. Can you have intimacy between dawn and sunset? You can't have intimacy between dawn and sunset, correct. You can after, yes. Remember, at night time, there's no harm. It's not sinful to do anything after Maghrib, right? There's not, it's not sin after that. You're allowed to eat and drink and so on and sexual intercourse and everything at night time. That's fine. There's no sin there. No, it doesn't have to be avoided for the entire month. Okay, let's read through this question. If you broke your fast intentionally and you weren't sick or you weren't ill, then you would have to do a one kafara for all the fasts that you broke, as well as the qada for them. But if you feel that you were so ill and sick that you, you needed to break your fast, then there will only be a qada. There will not be a kafara then, because that you're falling into the category of hmm. mouthwash. Again, same thing. You're still putting flavor into your mouth, so it still be makru. It should be avoided. Uh, spiritual aspects of Ramadan, we could do. I'm sure you can find more worthy people, inshallah, for that. Uh, the vaccine, so what it is, it's going to go through the veins and into the bloodstream, and then it's going to go into the body like that. Yes, stuff that goes into your digestive system also goes into the bloodstream, but this is kind of the bypassing that system. If you had a vaccine which somehow, or, or, or some sort of procedure which actually does go to the digestive system, then it will break. But generally, the research is vaccines, uh, injections that go into the arm and so on, they don't actually go through the digestive system, so they won't go. So hold can be considered anything. Have a glass of water. I think we covered a hadith that said even if it's a sip of water, have it. So have some. Um, ideally, when you break the fast, you can take uh, water. Uh, the reward of the fast, I don't think, will be reduced, but you'll miss the reward of having support. 
you won't swallow mouthwash, so you won't fast, but you won't, you won't break, but it'll be the, it'll come in the ruling of tasting something. So if you taste something, then you're fast. It becomes a makru. The makru becomes. Okay. Um, any other questions? For qada, if, if you don't know, if you miss so many, you're going to have to make an assessment, just like with salat. So some people, they have years of salat that they haven't kept, they haven't performed. So because of that, they um, you have to make an estimate. You have to try and work out and make an assessment from when you became mature, how many fasts, how many salat you missed, and then you make them up. Um, it, you can't just do a kafara and say that's not. You have to make them up, do the qada. And if you weren't keeping a fast, remember, there won't be a kafara for that. Kafara is only when you've actually broken the fast. A, a person who is not barely breaks his fast intentionally, there's going to be no kafara. Yeah, the fast will, they, they don't have to make up for that fast because they're not accountable at all. Yes, of course. I don't see any reason why a woman would not get the same blessing and reward. What age did you come from? So when you were badik, so when you became mature. So from the sister's perspective, the first time she had a menstruation or she became badik through age, from that time onwards. So if a person knows that they never used to fast at all, they'll be able to work out because just one month for each year. Swearing and anger doesn't break the fast. It ruins the spirituality of it, yes. It ruins the fact that, you know, you're, you're, you, you're, meant, to be under, you're meant to be keeping yourself in control, swearing. All of these things are going to impact the spirituality of it. So remember, the objective is to try and attain taqwa. So if you're avoiding eating and drinking, but you're swearing constantly, you're, you're really defeating the purpose there. But it won't break the fast, yes. You can't say the fast is broken. So again, if anything enters the digestive system via a valid entry point, it will break the fast. Kafara will only be if that thing came went through the mouth and has nutritional benefits, for example, food, drink, or some pleasure, like smoking. In that case, it's kafara. Otherwise, anything that enters the digestive system is qadda only. Kafara is exceptional to a very particular case. It has to be food and health, and it has to be nutritional, medicinal, and so on. When it comes to, uh, when it comes to intimacy, if it's sexual intercourse to the point of penetration, then that's kafara. Otherwise, sexual stimulation and ejaculation is qadda. From when they became Muslim, yes, for revert, when they became Muslim, from that time onwards. Can you read Ayatul Kursi? Yes. Uh, on menstruation, you can read anything from the Quran that had the meaning of dua inside it or praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Surah Falak, Surah Nas, Ayatul Kursi, Surah Fatiha, anything that has actual praise, the wording contains praise. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Allahu la ilaha illa al qiyum, or actual dua, Rabbana hablana min azwajina. And so on. When you're first learning, do you have to make up for mispraise? Of course, <clears throat> at the end of the day, you're gonna have to make up for what has been missed. You, you try your best. So if a person is still learning about Islam, then it's best to just you know try and get them onto the, the prayers that they're meant to be praying at the moment. And then once they're comfortable and they know how to pray, then they can start working on the prayers that have been missed. Yes, I've mentioned what you can read during Ramadan. So any, you can read, you can read du'as, you can read askar, you can read tasbih, you can read all of these kind of things. But when it comes to the Quran, because a menstruation woman cannot read Quran in the high of his school, uh, she can't read Quran unless it is a verse uh, which has the meaning of du'a in it or praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the intention is to read it as a du'a and not as a recitation. You can't read Fatiha as a recitation. On menstruation, you have to read it as a du'a. Okay. Any books? I actually don't have any in mind at the moment. If you in English, especially, I haven't come across any recently myself that I've been using. Um, 